Hello and welcome to Australia in Space TV. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the editor with My Security Media and publishers of the Australia in Space magazine. Today we're joined once again by John Curtin, Distinguished Professor Stephen Tingay from Curtin University. He's the Executive Director of the Curtin Institute of Radio Astronomy. Stephen, thanks for joining us once again. Yeah, no problem, Chris. Great to be here. Great. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the uh, Earth to Mars mission uh, with NASA and the like. Um, and I was just saying off camera, I've uh, been still hearing a lot of chatter about this particular mission. Uh, sort of one of the key questions is not only when are we going, but should we be going? And uh, given Artemis missions have just been delayed somewhat to the moon, uh, we obviously have to go to the moon first, but the ultimate goal is to colonise Mars. Uh, your general sort of take on the Mars mission, uh, you mentioned you're ex-JPL, so you've been sort of watching uh, the developments as we learn more and more about Mars. Uh, but, yeah, your general observations on where we're currently at and then we'll sort of get into how it's all going to work if it actually happens. Yeah, um, I was at the, the Jet Propulsion Lab in the, the late 90s, um, and it was really exciting to be there as a, a couple of the Mars missions were were in progress. Um, uh, and, and that, like many other missions and going back a long time, it, it is evidence of the, the place that, that Mars holds for humans. It goes back to antiquity. So I guess you know, one of my general feelings is that, um, you know, why has it taken so long to talk about getting to Mars? I guess we were on the moon a long time ago um, and then something happened. And um, yeah, I think in the normal course of events, you, you may have expected that we'd already be at Mars. But uh, as you point out, the Artemis mission is, uh, or Artemis program is you know, back to the moon as the, the first step towards uh, getting to Mars. And as you pointed out, the few delays recently, um, I think there's also been some pretty pretty impressive progress and there's definitely a new approach underway uh, between NASA and the commercial world. So, um, you know, it's an interesting new trajectory. The, um, we, we had NASA uh, in Perth and it's great to have you back uh, uh, with Curtin University from Perth, but we had a NASA contingent uh, in Perth last October for the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference. Uh, Dr. David Korsmeyer gave a really good briefing on the Mars mission and some of the hurdles to that, uh, the main one being distance, uh, delayed in communication. Uh, they've got other, and this is the way the NASA seems to work, they work mission to mission, they solve problems as they go along, um, and it's the optical communications and it's some really great advancements that they're making in the optical communications aspect to, to limit that, but we're still restricted by the speed of light. Uh, that's about the fastest we can communicate. <laughs> Um, I think one of the, and the other one we ran with Australian National University back in August, uh, the um, space medicine for earthlings and the impact of space on the human body and particularly, you know, the conversation was a colony on Mars. Uh, it's too far away to keep coming back and forth. The idea is once you go to Mars, you're most likely not coming back uh, and you're there as a colony. Uh, is that kind of the thinking that you get into in terms of understanding what the Mars mission is? It's not like going to the moon where we can come back uh, after a few days. This is months and years mission, and uh, therefore the, the thinking has to be completely different. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a very good description. Um, you know, the moon's 300,000 kilometres away. It's close enough to get there and get back. Um in a reasonable amount of time. Mars is a completely different proposition. It is um, you know, a fundamentally different step. I mean, you would say that that is probably the first significant step to making humanity interplanetary, which is the SpaceX yeah. motto. And, and I think that's absolutely right. Um, yes, the speed of light is a fundamental limit in terms of communication. Um, but I, I, I think that we just have to leave those types of considerations behind. And if you're going to go to Mars, you're right, it, it will be a colony. It's possibly a one-way trip. Um, and it's a situation in which you have to be fully self-reliant, autonomous, 
you just simply can't rely on communications back to the earth um, in a mission critical sense. So that is a fundamentally different situation. Um, and I think you know, the biggest challenge is having a launch vehicle that will uh, be capable of supplying that level of material to Mars um, in order to establish and then support um, a colony or a, an outpost. Um, so that's, that's clearly what, what Starship has um, got in its sights. Um, one of the things that encourages me, I think, is just the incredibly impressive progress on, on something like Starship, just a completely different methodology in terms of um, technical development, prototyping and, and design iteration. Um, so that's one of the things that causes me to be somewhat optimistic about the timescales. Um, I'm going to plug uh, Joe Sassell, who was uh, at the University of New South Wales, just giving a lecture, visiting from, uh, I think he's based in California, but he's with Trans Astronautics Corporation. They're looking at mining uh, asteroids and the like. Uh, and uh, he, he, you know, I won't quote him specifically, but he did question whether we should be going to Mars, whether we should be looking at other forms of building uh, celestial sort of uh, ships and the like. Mm -hmm. rather than colonising the likes of Mars. Um, maybe we come back to the fundamental of what is the main reason for wanting to go to Mars? What, what, what is the main, main fundamental other than it's just a, a problem to solve? Yeah, I think it depends a bit on who you talk to. Um, I think there's a few, a few elements, and I think perhaps some of those elements are a little bit orthogonal, but... Um, you can look up in the sky and you can look at Mars in the same way that you look at the moon and you can say, I want to go there. I want to explore that. Uh, I want to solve that problem. So there is a, I think there is a, a motivation in some sectors just simply for the exploratory nature. Um, you know, humanity has sent 50 missions to Mars of one type or another. Um, it is a, a fascinating planet it is a legitimate target for the search for life outside the Earth, either past or, you know, maybe even currently. So it is a legitimately important target for some fundamental research. So that, that's another m motivation as well. Um, you know, even at a higher level, I, you know, I come back to the, the SpaceX mantra, um, and the fact that it is cutting the umbilical cord with, with our planet in a way that the moon doesn't. Um, so it's a fundamental shift in, I think, the psychology of humanity if we establish a permanent presence on Mars. The steps after that don't seem so great. One Well, that does bring me to one sort of beyond question. I haven't planned some of these questions, so it's one of those discussions you can go in so many different directions. But... Once we're on Mars, what happens after that? Uh, what would a colony focus on? Is it the the minerals and the mining, uh, exploring for you know forms of life and um, that sort of the history uh, of a planet? We've still got a lot to learn uh, about it, um, and also the environment and, and adapting to that environment. Uh, there's discussions on subsurface colony and the like. Um, yeah, what, what would you imagine a colony be focusing on in Mars, sort of longer term? What's, what's the post we get there, we, we land and uh, we set up camp, uh, then what? Yeah, look, I, I think you can probably take your pick of Hollywood movies for the answer to that question. There's, um, in a lot of ways, human imagination through arts, literature, movies have, have really explored some of these themes. Um, and I, I don't have a good answer. I, I suspect the first port of call is going to be some as a base for scientific research. I, I think that's the logical first thing to do. And you know, personally, if I was going to Mars, I'd want to have a very specific mission because I think some of the psychological factors involved could be quite challenging. Um, you know, and experts, more expert in these things than me, uh, clearly thinking these sorts of things through. But, yeah, coming back to the psychology of cutting the umbilical cord with the earth, um, you know, there are human factors in that. 
And I don't think you would want to embark on something like that without a really clear objective and a really clear mission, especially if it's a one-way trip. <laughs> Very much so. One of the things, what are your observations on uh, new technology, The, the both we, we mentioned sort of optical communications and the like, but the advantages on here on Earth to a mission like Mars, both creating a sustainable, completely sustainable colony and how we can learn that and bring those learnings back to Earth, and as we as we create new technologies, new advances uh, in methodology, uh, is that one of the key advantages we need to be looking out for? And any any sort of early ones that you would pick up on to go look, we're, we are already learning and applying uh, new thinking because uh, it takes us outside of our comfort zone. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Look, I'm. I'm pretty sceptical of the economic viability of mining asteroids or the moon or Mars for traditional economic return. Um, I think a long-term viable human presence on, on Mars or the moon would, would have to rely on in situ materials at some level. Um, now, that's not a traditional economic mining market. That's a, that's a different thing. Um, so I sort of put some of the... The, the mining rhetoric aside, and I, I do think um, it is the attendant advantages and in innovations that come from simply solving the problem that are going to have by far the biggest economic impact uh, and, and societal impact here on Earth. And, you know, there's already been a, a pretty impressive track record of that out of the space endeavours over the decades. Um, and indeed, um, out of any sort of mega science scale research facility that, that has a, a fundamental objective here on Earth. So I, I work on the Square Kilometre Array project. Um, yeah, and you can run through the economic and social benefits as well as the fundamental science benefits coming out of those types of projects. So I, I think that's where the, the overwhelming majority of return is going to come. And I think that's pretty highly aligned with the, the approach NASA is taking of harnessing and leveraging the commercial world uh, in that trajectory, starting with Artemis um, and, and, and then to Mars. And, um, you know, I don't want to make an interview about SpaceX, but um, Falcon, Starship, the innovations that you're already seeing going into that, um, you know, Starship is amazing. We, we all watched the last test launch. Um, and as I listened to the intro, I was sort of horrified at the, the suite of changes they had made between test one and test two, including let's just, in, let's just include hot staging. <laughs> Who does that? Um, so that is brave innovation and it pretty much worked. Um, so that is a very accelerated technology development and the, the broader benefits that come out of those things are, are huge. I think the other thing that highlighted from uh, David Kozmeyer in, in uh, Perth is the autonomy, the autonomous flight, the autonomous landing. Uh, their mission to Titan is a completely autonomous uh, craft that will make its own decisions on where and when it lands. And I think that's the other aspect uh, and we may not sort of fully understand these new technologies until we get to the moon and we sort of uh, get back well, when I say get back to the moon uh, and we start to you know uh, mine the moon for, for water and the like and we use that as a catalyst uh, for relaunch so I think um, it becomes very exciting uh, over the next sort of 10 to 20 years just on how fast we will actually get there I think that's one thing that comes out is the time timeline becomes irrelevant do you think I think it's not a matter of saying that we have to be there at a time uh these are problems to solve and we methodically go through uh the process uh and just have the ultimate vision there but worry about uh the step-by-step -step process first and not so much put ourselves under pressure oh yeah the the absolute worst thing you can do in any um, groundbreaking type of project or initiative is set out a set of milestones with dates. Um, but unfortunately, that's what the people paying the bills also require. Um, so there's a little bit of a, uh, a dance around these things, I would say. 
and slippage is more common than not. Um, so it, it comes down to the, you know, the intent and the motivation and um, persistence and, 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 and things that you, you set out to do generally happen, happen. Maybe they're a couple of years late, you know, like JWST, maybe they're many years late and you know, billions of dollars over budget. Um, but that's what it takes. It, it takes what it takes to achieve these things. And as soon as the first images from JWST came through, everyone forgot the fact that it cost $10 billion. Yeah. Nobody cared. Um, so you know, when you're pushing the boundaries, uh, Gantt charts are your, are your enemy. Um, but actually, I, it would not shock me, at, at least from the launch system point of view and the technical ability to get there, that um, we'll be in shape to get to Mars quicker, I think, than probably most people expect. Um, now, there are many, many other factors to consider and requirements to meet, um, but I, I think some parts of the program are really going to accelerate more quickly than everyone expects. And I think finally, uh, this interview is on the, the back of um, NASA's invited the private sector to make some missions uh, for Mars mission. What what opportunities do you see even bringing it home back to the Australian sector, but the private sector is already playing a, a significant part in the new developments in space? What opportunities do you see here and maybe low-hanging fruit for the Australian uh, space sector? Oh, I don't think there's anything anything you would call low-hanging fruit in this sector. Very, it's, um, very it's, cool. it's enormously competitive, um, and there are many, many players all around the world. Um, Where do so you see yeah, our things already, Steve? In, in terms of Australia, I think it comes down to market signals. Um, what is it that, that we want to do in Australia? Where do we want to participate? We're in Artemis. We're doing a rover. Um, what else should we be doing to position Australian industry and Australian academia to you know, not just participate but take the lead in a few things? And uh, maybe before you go, any updates on the SKA? How's that progressing? Uh, construction is well underway. Um, in, in fact, uh, early next month, I'll be heading up to the, the site in the Murchison. There's a little bit of a celebration of the installation of the very first antennas after quite a lot of the um, underlying infrastructure work has, has been completed. Um, there are trenches uh, going around the site and the, there's antennas going down. So, um, yes, we are at the pointy end and um, the end is in sight. Wonderful. Well, I was uh, pleased to, to visit your centre uh, back in October as well as part of the site visits for IPSEC. So uh, it's always good to have you back on Australia in Space TV. Like I said, uh, very uh, sort of broad subject matter in terms of our uh, Mars missions uh, and what NASA is doing. But we'll have the links in the show note. You wrote an, issue, um, an article for the conversation uh, with some links in that as well. So we'll have that in the show notes. But otherwise, John Curtin, Distinguished Professor, Stephen Tingay, Executive Director of the Curtin Institute of Radio Astronomy. Thanks for once again for joining us from Perth for Australia in Space TV. Yeah, no problem, Chris. Cheers.